Hello, I'm going to be giving you some examples of parallel systems inside and actually outside a computer. And also we're going to be talking about parallel processing more generally. So this is the complete execution of different instructions simultaneously, simultaneously meaning at the same time. So let's start by saying the benefits of parallel processing. We have to be quite careful here to be precise enough in our descriptions of the benefits. The most obvious benefit is we are able to execute more instructions in a given time period because we're doing multiple instructions at the same time. And that's the way we need to word it. We can't just say stuff like, oh, it's faster because that's not quite specific enough. It might result in a program executing faster because we're able to do more of its instructions in a given time period. That is definitely our main, main benefit of parallel processing. The kind of secondary benefits are, well, if I've got five processing units and I'm able to utilize all five at once, this is more efficient. I've not got hardware being left idle. And also it doesn't happen a lot of the time, but having multiple things working in parallel means if one of them breaks, one of them is held up in a bottleneck waiting for something else to happen, or we have a complete failure. This means we've got backup units which can continue our execution. Now to be a bit of a stickler, to be parallel processing, technically speaking, each instruction needs to be executed at the same stage as each other and also be completely independent of each other. Now this essentially rules out pipelining as an example of parallel processing. Technically speaking, pipelining is an example of concurrency and concurrency and parallelism are similar but slightly different terms. Arguably parallelism is an example of concurrency, but concurrency is when we have multiple instructions executing in overlapping time periods. So we have got some overlap between these instructions. And this diagram I've shown before with the pipelining video. Are they being executed at exactly the same stage as each other? No. While instruction one is executing, instruction two is decoding and instruction three is being fetched. So they're not at the exact same stage as each other. And are they independent of each other? No, because instruction two is waiting for instruction one to finish. Instruction three is waiting for instruction two to finish. So they're not independent. Whereas if we had three instructions starting at the same time, ending at the same time, and they could all work independent of each other, that is true parallel processing. Now, this is confusing. I can recall being at university being quite worried about me getting this wrong in an exam. The honest answer is that's rarely an issue because people try and avoid it in computer science because it is confusing. And you'll see occasionally people make this mistake, even people who are quite good at computer science. So we want to try and keep that separate in our minds. Essentially, don't give pipelining as an example of parallel processing. So what examples can we give of parallel processing in a computer? Well, we can look at this at different levels starting really small and going a bit bigger. We do have parallel processing within a single circuit in the ALU, for example. So some instructions are called bitwise operations. We'll look at these later in the course, but this is where we apply operations like XOR or 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 AND or NOT to individual bits. And here I could choose to do this one by one, which is called in serial. So I could go one XOR one is zero. 0 XOR 1 is 1, 1 XOR 1 is 0, and so on and so on. That is done in serial. And I could design a circuit which does that in serial. We also can find examples of parallel processing inside a single core. And this is where pipelining is tempting to say, but pipelining isn't technically parallel processing. So an example that is, is superscalar processing. So this is where if your CPU has got multiple circuits which can be used independently, Maybe I've got an LU, maybe I've got a floating point unit as well. The contemporary processor can be clever and utilize both of these at the same time. So maybe we've got two instructions, currently both I execute, it's giving one of these to the LU, one of these to the FPU. And it might do this through out of order execution. If it figures out that actually the FPU is going to be idle for a few clock cycles, we might as well give it some jobs to do at the same time as the LU. So again, this is trying to maximize our hardware ensuring that nothing is left idle. The best examples of parallel processing come in once we start to add multiple cores to our CPUs, because each core is able to carry out independently an FDE cycle for different instructions. So if I've got four cores on a CPU, I can do up to four instructions simultaneously. As we looked at in the last video, we often have multiple processors in a computer, most notably a CPU and a GPU. 
Each is able to execute either different programs or different parts of programs. If you're playing a very intensive video game, part of a video game will be calculated on the CPU, part will be delegated to the GPU. Most obviously the graphical parts will be given to the GPU. And you've probably heard of supercomputers. A supercomputer is a computer which often has multiple CPUs or multiple GPUs. And these work together to add more processing power overall. We can also use parallel processing across multiple computers. This is what the field of distributed computing is trying to achieve, where complex tasks get split across multiple computers, and these are connected together via networks, either a local network or via the internet. So cloud computing is almost always running off of distributed systems, with each individual computer executing one part of the task, and then the results are combined to solve whatever is being trying to be achieved. So in summary, we have lots of different examples of parallel processing within a computer. It's important we don't just talk about cores only. These aren't the only examples, although arguably these are our best examples of this. Clearly, parallel processing has a big benefit to us. We wouldn't be putting all this effort in if it wasn't for a benefit. However, as we'll look at in the next video, it's not always this simple. Some problems are really good for parallel processing. Some problems just have issues where we could have a million cores, but we still can't necessarily speed things up as much as we want to.